game is to be where you are, be it honestly and as consciously as you know how. Watch the latest Ram Dass documentary film, Becoming Nobody, on Gaia.com. Of course, there was fear in losing that familiar identity. But there was always also wonder. The Gaia.com library supports you with transformational content. See it for yourself and go to Gaia.com slash Be Here Now and check out the Be Here Now playlist curated just for you. Visit Gaia.com slash Be Here Now and start your free trial today. Welcome to Ramdas Here and Now. This is Raghu Marcus, the host for the next hour or so. And before I get into it, as I usually do, I like to uh, give kudos to our partner, 1440.org, 1440 Multiversity, but go to 1440.org to see all of the wonderful workshops they have near Santa Cruz in this beautiful campus, as I've mentioned many times before. But we have a friend, Dan Siegel. Dan's been on the Mind Rolling podcast. For those of you who haven't checked that out, that's another podcast that I do, uh, working and chatting with people like Dan, who's an amazing psychiatrist from Los Angeles, UCLA, around mindfulness. And uh, he's going to be doing something called Cultivating Stress Resilience. And... Uh, it's going to be around uh, September 20th. It's with a partner, uh, a work partner, Elisa Eppel. It's something that I should be going to. Unfortunately, I'll be uh, cultivating stress resilience in India at that time. <laughs> but uh, it sounds fantastic. Dan is quite a brilliant person. So I highly recommend that. Also, here's something else, forest bathing. I've heard of it before. And suddenly I'm gravitating more and more to using nature as a way to transcend some of these, um, shall we say, stressful uh, situations that we don't seem to be very resilient around. So forest bathing with Sylvie Roca. And that's uh, sometime towards the end of August. Go to 1440.org and check it out. And they're wonderful people. And it's a beautiful place. Uh, I also want to mention our collaboration with East Forest, wonderful musician, East Forest and Ramdas. The full length album, we've been putting out uh, every quarter a few songs, but the full length album's coming out now, August 9th. Okay, so uh, you can sign up to ramdas.org if you are already not on the mailing list, and you will get the links and so on. It's just an extraordinary a album and an extraordinary collaboration from uh, East Forest. Also, I had him on a podcast on Mind Rolling, and that'll be out around the same time. So you can check out some of the songs just by listening to that podcast. So East Forest, fabulous piece of music. Okay. Now for the real stuff. This is Ram Dass from July 1986 in Cuesta, New Mexico. Amazing. And um, this is a lot about relationships. And it's uh, a lot about how we evolved, how our individual consciousness evolves. And interestingly enough, he uses uh, some of the great saints of the past, including particularly Ram Ramana Maharshi, Ramana Maharshi, who, when he was 16, 17, he decided he was going to see what reality was. Um, and anyhow, Ram Dass tells that story, but here's somebody in one life who realized uh, himself and realized the truth. And... Um, and he just talks about how beings who have had many, many incarnations, they can see through the veil. So, and here, here's, the, here's the bottom line. When, when someone realizes that there is an awakening possible, okay, 
You start the journey and you realize it's been going on for lifetimes before and yet to come. And as Ram Dass says, what else is there to do then but work to wake up and be free? So it's the first step, the very, very, very first step that realizing there is an awakening possibility. And it comes through many, many, many different forms. Um, yeah, he talks about how uh, new beings, the people that maybe haven't had a ton of lifetimes, it's hard to imagine how this all works, right? So we don't want to try and figure it out. That's what Maharaji said. Just don't try and figure it out. Just love everyone and tell the truth. Uh, not easy. Um, so, pe- But new people come in, you know, uh, in- young incarnations, and they have a passion for the material And they don't really have an intuitive sense. They don't have an idea of their intuitive sense. And uh, and he uses, uh, of course, a funny thing. Uh, You know, people who marry for passion, which that might be quite a large percentage of the population, because that has to be there. So it's an interesting ingredient that doesn't last. Uh, And sometimes so you marry for passion but you don't really kind of take in all of the other aspects of a person when you do that and you end up so sometimes you end up with what he calls post neanderthal person with like uh the the guts of an old tibetan lama and eventually that probably won't work out very well (laughs) oh god There's a great quote he uses here. Civilization is the act of voluntary renunciation. And Gandhi said that. Mahatma Gandhi. Right? Civilization is the art of voluntary renunciation. We seem to be getting way away from that these days. So, some of the rest of what he talks about here is the relationship with uh, aging sickness, denial about needing help. You see, at some point, and Ram Dass went through this himself when he got the stroke, and he used to say, I wrote a book, how can I help? Now I need to write a book, how can you help me? And he went through a lot. He still goes through it a little bit. Sometimes I'm around and I want to help him do something. He'll give me a look, like, what are you doing? I can take care of myself right here, you know, so... This is something, you know, we become busy. He says, busy being somebody independent. Yeah. Because you lose your prerogative of decision making, you know, when when the aging gets advanced, when the infirmities get advanced, when the diseases get advanced. And he gave a whole uh, example of being with uh, his stepmom, Phyllis. And he said the caregiving that he gave her opened his heart more than anything up to that moment because they found she was in such denial and was uh, very opposed to have anyone do anything for her. And he finally, she finally let him in. And the way in which that love manifested between them was extraordinary for him. And uh, what else he talk about here? He talks about... You, you hear what your dharma is. You hear what your role is in life. And you do your best to fulfill it impeccably. Now, what does impeccably mean? To me, uh, you're, you're, um, you don't confuse, and he says this, you do not confuse the role that you understand you have to fulfill in life, and the role of your work, the role of being... Uh, a father, a mother, a son, a daughter, a friend, whatever it might be, is you don't confuse the role with the expression of love. The action comes out of love, not out of mental construct, meaning you're not stuck in a role. So you you're able to rest in your what he calls isness. And uh so the action comes out of love. It's very, very difficult, but very important for us to reach to, I believe. Um, and finally, you know, we realize 
We may be in a family of however many people. It may be an extended family. But when you understand that, or when you are more conscious, a conscious family sees that beyond the numbers, there is only the one. Now, I had personal experience of this, very fortunate, many of you know this, if you, especially if you listen to Mind Rolling, that my family was splintered, and I went to India and met Maharaji, and the way that he glued us back together was nothing less than a miracle, and it centered around my father and many of well, if you if you don't know this story, it's it's a story of Maharaji basically telling me to give my father acid, and he, he called it, of course, the yogi medicine, the yogi medicine Ramdas gave me. Anyhow, all of that ensued, and my father broke into a billion pieces when he came back with not through the acid trip. The acid trip just showed him, uh, took him through the process of uh, of what death is. But when he met, came back to see Maharaji, then he, uh, he basically broke into a thousand pieces. And after he was put back together and sent back to Canada, and then he came back months later and spent several months there, and the initial time was just three weeks, two weeks, everything changed. Our family came together in a way that only I've seen Indian families, because my brother, my sister, all of their uh, husbands and wives, and, and including my mother, although it was later on for her, um, we came, to, we that family of, which ended up, you know, six, seven people, including wives and husbands, that family, we did realize to some degree when we were, more or less in our most conscious moments, because what my father did, we the thing of understanding there is only one, and that we as a family, he had a place out in near near the Vermont border in Quebec where we lived, and it was a place where much of the satsang used to come over a period of time, after especially right after India, and uh, I I really feel like Maharaji gave us that. Uh, this concept, which no longer was a concept for for us, uh, seeing beyond the numbers, there is only the one. And uh, yeah, I feel very fortunate, very fortunate. All right, I don't want to get maudlin here. Um, this is a great talk around r relationships and the idea of uh, how you relate with this consciousness that we've been given and how we... Uh, relate with uh, the aging process. So here it is. Again, it was, uh, what is it, July 12th, 1986 in Cuesta, New Mexico. Here's Ramdas, here and now. If you look at, um, if you look at evolution, of consciousness as something that happens in individuals, not in large numbers, but in individuals. So as you look out on the street, you're seeing a cross section of evolution. You're seeing, I'm talking now from a reincarnational model, which for some of you I know is alien, but just humor me. Um, some of the people you're seeing are very old beings. That is, they're beings who have incarnated many, many times and for whom the veil is very thin. They really They've gone into the movie so many times and into the drama so many times that although they're in it, they're just about seeing through it. It's pretty frayed. And they can sort of see through the cloth already. And they're playing it. See, the extreme ends of the, re of the evolutionary continuum are somebody like a saint in India, like Ramana Maharshi, a being who who doesn't do any sadhana, no spiritual practices, nothing. And at 17 years old, He's lying in his father's uncle's study and he suddenly feels he's going to die and instead of fighting, he just opens to it and he experiences the death of his body and just goes on and then 
His body doesn't physically die, but he dies out of it. And from then on, for the next 40 or 50 years, he's one of the great enlightened saints of India. And people who come to him get great peace and great wisdom and great understanding and great love. And he was what's called an old being. He was ripe. He didn't have to do anything. Then there are beings who we suspect came to earth fully conscious with the intent of doing things for other people, like a Christ or Krishna. Then we have people like the Buddha who work and do sadhana during their lifetime, and they're old beings, but they still do something to get to the point where they finally get free, but they get free in this lifetime. Then there are other beings like, for example, me, I think, who just works, realizes in this birth that there is an awakening possibility and starts the journey and continues the journey that I've been probably doing in the past many lifetimes and probably will be doing for many lifetimes yet to come. And I just do it and I'm stopped counting and I'm just doing it because what else is there to do than work to wake up? be free. And I have no expectation that I'm about to get enlightened or I'll be enlightened this life or any of that stuff. It doesn't even matter to me anymore because I don't have any choice anyway. And then there are new beings who just recently came out of the Neanderthal stage and they've just come to earth see? and they, they are just I want this and gimme and rrr and rrr and rrr and rrr. And they have it from birth to death and they're frightened of death and they grab life and they just want more. And God is a bunch of crap or else it's some ritual that they do mechanically. There's no feeling, there's no sense of a higher, a sense of a, a, a way or a, a form of the universe. They don't have any sense of that. They don't have any connection to their intuitive sense. Well, the funny thing is that you can have a family in which the whole range is within one family. In fact, you may have married one. I mean, you may have married for a peculiar reason, like passion, for example. And you end up with a post Neanderthal married to an old Tibetan Lama, you know, I mean, it's, and they just happen to be together for some bizarre reason, you know, and, and they wake up one morning wondering what the hell am I doing in this situation? They come rushing to me saying, I'm working on myself spiritually and <laughs> what am I going to do with this one? You see, and that, well, so it is with your kids. Your kids are unique entities that have come to earth to do their unique work. And you may be surprised if you have two or three children, why they are all so different. Because you did the same things and they grew up in the same. I mean, I was a psych, I was a child developmental psychologist, a research scientist in developmental psychology, trying to explain why children turn out the way they do in view of what parents do. And we did things with computers and experiments and double blind and all kinds of good stuff. And the best we ever were able to do in the big issue of heredity and environment was if you put both heredity and environment together, you could probably account, you could get a correlation of what's called 0.5, which means you were accounting for 25% of the variability, 25% of the range of what happened to kids you could account for by everything that we could measure. 75% we called error. <laughs> and I learned that I have been living for the past 20 years in error. I mean, it turns out that's where I live. It's error of reincarnation and all that kind of stuff. So that when I... I see families, I see a tremendous mixture. And the minute you get into the judging mode, you are in a tricky position. The minute you decide that older is better, like if you understand the whole sense of the circle of incarnation, being an older being isn't better, it's just different. 
Would you say that 20 years old is better than 10 years old? It's just different. And you realize that each being has a unique route through with the unique ways of getting caught and attached and awakening or not awakening. And you end up being an appreciator of individual differences rather than a judge about them. I said this before, and I got to keep re-saying it because it's so easy to get sucked into that. I went to college. Why aren't you going to college? because I'm dancing to a different drama. Don't give me that crap, go to college. You'll be sorry later. I mean, we all know all the routines that, that we've all grown up around in the culture of I know what's best for you because it was good for me. Because we have the kind of individual freedom that nobody in the world has ever had before. But that individual freedom we are finding out can be a path to incredible suffering if we throw out the baby with the bath. And to invite, I mean, when the grandfather helped raise the grandson and they went fishing together and they talked and the grandfather told stories to the kid all day there was a whole cultural transmission that went on of the wisdom of what that man had learned that was passed on to the generation. It doesn't happen with Looney Tunes on Saturday morning in television. It just doesn't, it's not the same transmission. It's for a different motive, it's a different set of motives. So when you have relationships that are given karma, and you have people that are from all different levels of consciousness and you've been thrown together with them. I can't understand why I've been thrown together with my older brother. His interests are not my interests. If I were choosing who I would hang out with, I wouldn't choose my older brother to hang out with or either one of them actually. But I have them and there they are. And what happens is I learn a lot about who I am not and who I am just through being around them. Although I wouldn't have chosen. And that's the interesting thing that given karma overrides choice. The choices that personality makes. It's a chance to see the way in which you have catered to your personality and a, a chance to push against it a little bit. We have such a, I'm playing with a, a, such a delicate and uncomfortable edge, edge which is the one that, full, the idea that fulfilling roles brings freedom, even though the, and the roles are not just responding to your personality desires and needs. Gandhi once said, civilization is the art of voluntary renunciation which means you give up certain things in yourself in order to be able to play a part in a dance. And I th apocryphally, somebody said to Gandhi, what do you think about Western civilizations? And he said, I didn't know there were any. I don't think he actually said that because it doesn't, it doesn't sound Gandhi-like, but... But you take, for example, some of you parents are approaching the age where there is a good likelihood you're going to get sick because that's what happens when people get old. And when you get sick, it's a good, there's a good chance that you're going to at some point need help. And when you die, there's a good chance that you are going to need some support system for dying. If you look in your hearts and your personality structure, you will see that place in you that has loathing about dependency, that has loathing about needing to ask somebody for something, about needing help from somebody. See, we threw over the structure of roles that would have automatically provided that. So now it has to be provided through the beneficence of somebody, not through the expectation of role. Is this too complicated or are you? 
my stepmother, Phyllis, um, got sick in August and she died last January. And uh, she was a fiercely independent woman. She didn't marry until her 50s. She was a strong, tough lady. And um, she and I just really kept our space. We, we honored each other. But honor didn't mean we did everything each other wanted. We just kept it together very well over the years. And then she got sick. And she was now my stepmother. And at first, when I started to take care of her, and I mean, she was taking care of herself, and then slowly, as it became more the need for somebody to help her in terms of planning things and structure and taking over some of the family stuff, and I started to do it, I, it was like walking on eggshells because she might accept one thing and then lash out at another. You'd prepare a meal and she'd say, I don't want this, I just want a tuna fish salad sandwich. And uh, yes, of course. So you, the next time you'd prepare a tuna fish salad sandwich and she didn't want that or whatever. And it was psychologically delicate stuff to work with. Because she was busy being somebody independent. And she was very jealous of her power, of her prerogatives, because she was losing them. Because you do lose them when you get sick and you do lose them when you get old. And that's the way of things, everybody. The way, it's not an error, it's the way things are. It's not a mistake of God, that's just how it is. And I saw in myself that part of me that had been in a power struggle with her over the years, that every little loss of power she had where I took over, I could afford to be very... Uh, giving about it all, because I had just won. Horrible. And I saw that in myself, and I allowed it. I mean, that was the way I was. That was my stuff to work with. And that part in me that was busy winning and losing in the power domain was reinforcing her pain about her loss of power. Can you hear the way one person's mind creates the environment for another person. It's just what I said yesterday. And then a funny thing started to happen. Phyllis and I started to fall in love. I mean, it would happen when we'd be, you know, today I'd be sitting on the edge of the bed and we'd be talking about something and she was getting weaker and softer. And I was getting, feeling safer in her presence. And we went through all of the stuff of shame, embarrassment, where first when you take her to the bathroom, you take her to the door of the bathroom, and then you close the door so she has her privacy. And then later on, you take her into the bathroom and then get her to the toilet and then go out and close the door. And then a little while later, you take her to the toilet and you taking down her underwear and sitting on the toilet and wiping her and then you're, it's, and it just goes on. I mean, slowly, slowly, it just opens until finally here we are, we're just human beings hanging out together. And all that stuff of the mind has fallen away. And suddenly there we are in love with each other, just in the state of love together. Where she lies in the bed and I have her in my arms and we're talking and she's saying, what do you think happens after you die? And she's starting to float in and out of her body and we're working, we're talking together about the pain and the pills and all that stuff and milkshakes and all the things. And I saw in that experience that I who had become so blase about working with dying since I had all this stuff, when it got to my stepmother and I had to deal with the fact that one night she was suffering because of having to go to the bathroom every 10 or 15 minutes, I had to carry her in and her body was in such pain, it was very painful for her. And I had not arranged for a catheter and I didn't have one during that night and I ended up with incredible feelings of guilt that I had not been a good enough caretaker. And I saw that I had to work with that one too.
And when she finally got ready to die, and she said, sit me up straight, and I sat her up on the side of the bed, and I put one hand in her heart and one hand on the back of her, her back, and I leaned against her head to keep her head upright. And she took three breaths and she left, which is exactly the way an old Tibetan Lama would do it. I thought, who is this? Yeah. All I can tell you is that as I look back on my life, I think the opportunity to care for Phyllis was one of the most graceful experiences I've had this lifetime. I think it opened my heart more than most things have opened my heart. I think it gave me a sense of function and a sense of being at peace with myself that I had not experienced up to that moment. Now, if I had said to Phyllis a year before, you may become so sick that you will need help and I'll help you. Boy, I would not have been in the house to hear her reaction. Because it would have horrified her so much. And it ended up that she was so soft and sweet and happy at the end. <clears throat> she was so happy at the end. She was so happy. She was happier than she was <clears throat> as a person in her life because the boundaries had started to dissolve and suddenly she could come out of that tight angularity and be back in the flow of love. And the, the thing that gave it that opportunity was this role reversal that happened. So I, I raise the issue because it's relevant to a lot of people now or later or sometime. And I think that the way we receive gifts are through the forms that are presented to us in our incarnation, the opportunities that are presented to us. And that we can turn them. Form can be a trap or it can be something that frees you. Religion can be a trap or it can be something through which you can get freed. Meditation you can just become a dry old meditator, which is absolutely nowhere to tell you the truth. Or you can become free through meditation. A family can be a strangling tight uh, thing that, it, that catches you and tortures you, or it can become a vehicle for your freedom. When you understand that you have taken birth in order to go through a set of experiences through which you can awaken to the truth of your being, that part of you that is not identified with the form, but is in the form. When you understand that what is what your life is about, all the institutions you find yourself in become opportunities through which you can become free. You use it all and you use the family and the way you use the family is to become a dharmic parent or a dharmic son, meaning you hear the role and you fulfill it impeccably. You are a perfect daughter or a perfect son, not perfect in the sense of somebody else's model of this is what I think you should do as a perfect son. You have to listen to that. But you are listening to that, to hear where the form is and how to get through it. It doesn't mean a, a birthday card. That isn't what it is. But it might be. But it's as if you are this formless being that comes down into form. And as, as long as you struggle against the forms, they've got you. And the minute you liquidly flow into the form, you're free.
I remember driving in India. I had a Volkswagen bus in India. And when I drive in India, there was the Grand Trunk Highway, which is the main thoroughfare of India. And I used to drive, and I would drive around 33 miles an hour. And when I try to drive 33 miles an hour, I had to sit on the horn all the time. And because on the Grand Trunk Highway, you've got to understand there are trucks, there are buses, there are a few cars, there are camels, there are water buffalo, there are donkey carts and horse carts. There's an elephant now and then. And people, lots of people. And I would be exhausted at the end of the day. And I thought, oh boy, what did I need to get a car for? This is a nightmare, driving through India. And I found out this interesting secret. If I slow down to 29 miles an hour, it all worked perfectly. The camels and the water buffaloes, they all work by 29 miles an hour. I mean, if they heard the horn in the distance, they would, it would go into that water buffalo mind, which is very slow, see? And something very slow would happen, and there'd just be the slightest turn. And then by the time I got there, I'd just go by. And I was completely at peace. And I realized I am free in the form because I listened to hear the way to be in harmony with it. It took me until I was about 50 years old to hear what I'm telling you now. To let it sink in. And to realize the that I wasn't going to get free by keeping my, my, my incarnation at a distance. I was going to become free through my incarnation, not in spite of it, through my forms. Through honoring, through honoring roles, through appreciating uniqueness of myself and others, not judging it. The judging is the one that cuts you off. From things. Appreciating brings you towards it. Cultivating the quality of the heart. You're going into appreciating. I appreciate my father is uniquely my father. He is an essence George Albert. He would be a terrible Moses, but he's a perfect George Alfred. And it's interesting to look at another human being and see them as an absolutely perfect statement of what it is that one is. Instead of constantly having a yardstick to measure, well, is this one as good as that one on this dimension? I've been dealing now for years, as many of you have, with people growing up around you. And I have watched people who seemed lost to the world in the 60s. I've seen them in mental hospitals. I've seen them drugged out of their minds. I've seen them in all kinds of weird states and, and their parents saying, oh, I lost this kid and it's too bad. And I see them end up sometimes having come out the other end and being what in Yiddish we call a mensch, which means a real being. There's a fellow I work with now that he goes to Harvard in the winter and he spends the summers in mental hospital. And I can't quite figure out which is the best curriculum for him. <laughs> I tell you the truth. I think it's a very rich curriculum. I think we are learning now that children that look good at 10 don't necessarily end up being good at 30. Nor are there clear rules in the game that you can, you can't have a book. There's no Spock finally for parent-child stuff. 
it's an intuitive process of listening and keeping it alive and keeping it liquid truth. One more word and I'll stop. I want to talk about this word about truth and license. If you are with another human being and you, if you want to get free, if you want to awaken and get free, you can do it dealing with the people around you without expecting that they will also want to get free. If you're lucky, you'll be around other people who also want to get free. That is called, in Buddhism, it's called the Sangha, or in Hinduism, it's Satsang. Every religion has that. It's the, the fellowship, the community, the spiritual community of the people who are seeking together. And it's very reinforcing to those qualities in you that want to awaken to be around other people who similarly want to awaken because they help remind you of it. Why we, we look for people that are simpatico to those values. The highest one of those is where two people have consciously and intentionally said, yes, let us get free and let us use our relationship with one another as one of the vehicles for doing that. And in order to do that, since we know that in freedom there is truth, since there's no risk in real truth in, free, in the free universe, let us be truthful with one another. That is a very high and very special relationship. It is very rare, very rare. We are all relatively truthful people. But the amount of edges where we use the white lie or the social truth, or we just color it just a bit because we don't want to hurt the other person. Because we want, we, we trade off kindness for truth. And kindness leaves you isolated. I hate to say it. I mean, it's, it's bizarre to say that because isn't it important to be kind? The secret truth is you've got to listen to hear what the license is between you and another human being. If it's the license for truth, then you are free to speak truth. If there is not a license, you are not really free to speak truth. You can be silent. But most relationships are a conspiracy saying, I won't upset your ego if you don't upset mine. And most families survive by doing that. I mean, if I were really pushing this retreat, which I don't see as my role, take a father and a son and put them next to each other, looking into each other's eyes, and they start out with the exercise where one says to the other, if there is anything you can bring to mind that would be difficult, embarrassing, or uncomfortable to say to me, say it. Well, I've always hated the way you pick your nose. And then you train around and do it the other way. And you keep doing it and doing it and doing it. And it just keeps, it's like soup. All the fat keeps rising to the surface of, oh, God, do I have to say that? And that and, ugh, yeah. And if that is done with love, those two people end up just in a liquid space of appreciation. It's all just stuff. What difference did it all make? And behind it all, here we are. But very few people want to play that game or necessarily should play. And it's not a failure to not play the game. Not at all. I couldn't play it with my father or my mother. I've played it with very few people. Well, that isn't true. I've played it with a lot of people, but they are people who come to me to play that game. Very different. But 
what I'm trying to suggest to you is what the highest possibility is in a family. A family is a family of yogis. A family is a family of people, all of whom want to go to God together or want to get liberated together and say, let's help each other do that and let's use truth to do it and let's use every technique we can and let's use silence at times in the home as a vehicle so that we can meet in the place behind our own minds. Let's meditate together. Let's come to retreats together. Let's reach out to try to do something to bring ourselves into a higher state of consciousness together so that we can get out from under the illusion of our own separateness that is keeping us isolated even in the midst of the plenty of our love for each other. Behind lecturer and hearer, behind mother and son, mother and daughter, father and son, father and daughter, wife and husband, friend and friend, brother and sister. Just beyond that, just beyond that. Here we are. Tasting and touching and recognizing that leaves us free to dance, leaves us free for the lila, for the play, for the dance, for the joyful delight of the way the formless comes into form. Then we can fulfill the roles without being caught in them. We can play our part. We can play the part impeccably because we're not confusing the part with the expression of love. Because the love already exists. The action is coming out of love. The action isn't designed to bring love. I just touched a, an iceberg. Sorry. As long as you are identified with your separateness, little me, you will constantly look around the world to get proof that you are loved, that you are enough, that you're safe, that it's okay. You are needful. Always needful. And most relationships end up, I'll, I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine. When you have worked on yourself so that you're resting in what you are, you're resting in your presence, in your isness, in your love, then all of your actions are a celebration of it. They don't come out of your separateness, they come out of the unity. What our journey through life is, is the opportunity to wake out of our separateness so that we can be unique without being lost in it. Not special, but unique. We come from one, we are born into separateness, we become caught in separateness, we awaken out of separateness, back into the one, out of the one, a marriage that really is living truth has three things in it. Male, female, awareness. When the two become one, then they can dance as two. When there's only two, it's me and her or me and him. Is there one of us here, or are we just the many? Is the family one, two, four, six? A conscious family sees that beyond the numbers, there is the one. I mean, the religions say it, they say it, they say it, they say, keep God in the family. 
or keep what, because that's the word, the word offends some people. Keep the one present. If you don't recognize that part of you that is part of everything else, you are jipping yourself this lifetime. This podcast is brought to you by the Love Serve Remember Foundation and Ramdas.org. We appreciate you listening and we appreciate all the support that you've given us. Please continue that support and donate at Ramdas.org. We can then continue to share what Ramdas has been sharing for all of these years. Thank you.